Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship here at the Bridgewater Baptist Church. And uh, if you're visiting with us today, my name is Aaron Kenny, and I have the pleasure of serving here as a lead pastor. Uh, I want to welcome all those who are joining us online over YouTube and Facebook and those who are listening over CKBW Radio here on the South Shore of Nova Scotia. Our services are broadcast on CKBW Radio the second and third Sunday of every month. And uh, we also have the pleasure of broadcasting here in Bridgewater on 98.7 FM every Sunday morning. Our services uh, are going to continue on at 11 a.m. throughout the month of June. But on the first Sunday of July, we make our switch to our summer hours. And our services will begin at 10 a.m. Um, we want to thank especially all the ladies and uh, those who are volunteering in our kitchen and cafe. If you arrive a, little bit, a bit early, usually at 10.30 uh, on Sunday mornings in June, we've been having a coffee and fellowship time. And just want to give a big round of applause and thanks to all those who are serving. Thank you. We have some great visitors who are with us today, and I, I think I even spotted Brian MacArthur and Roseanne, so welcome. And just before we begin the service, I'm going to invite you to stand and turn to the people around. If you, if you see someone you don't know, introduce yourself, and we're going to begin the service together in just a few moments. Again, we want to welcome everyone who's joining us for the service today, and those who are joining us over radio and online. There are a number of announcements of things going on in the life of this church and community, and you can find them online at our bulletin at bridgewaterbaptist.com, and just hit the newsletter or update. Each week we put out a new bulletin. And of course, for those who are in the sanctuary, there are always printed copies as well. Um, today, uh, June the 12th, there is a special benefit concert for the Ukraine that's happening here at the Bridgewater Baptist Church at 564 Glen Allen Drive here in beautiful Bridgewater. And this is a benefit being put on by the Interchurch uh, Council. This is the, the, the community of churches throughout Bridgewater and area coming together in order to uh, lend our support and prayers for the people of the Ukraine. And so the, uh, the Ukraine relief is going to the Red Cross and uh, everyone is welcome to come from our church and from the entire community. Uh, it starts at 3 o'clock this afternoon. There's going to be uh, music playing throughout uh, the afternoon and into about the evening to about 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. And uh, upon entrance, uh, they're looking for any donation you'd like to give to go towards the, uh, the Red Cross's work in Ukraine. Um, there's also going to be a supper, and that's available in the cafe as you come into the church at a cost of $10. And again, all, again, all of the proceeds will be going in support of the Red Cross. There's lots of announcements in the bulletin, so I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, but uh, there's some other people I do want to recognize today. We want to welcome uh, uh, Matthias, who is going to be playing on our instrumental today. Welcome to Matthias. And he is an international student visiting from Colombia and living with the Rands. So Paul and Janice have uh, just uh, been wonderful to be able to introduce us to him. And, uh, and I'm told that he's really uh, getting a part of Canadian culture. He's come to really love ketchup and the Toronto Maple Leafs. I think that's... <laughs> I think I got that backwards. <laughs> Anyway, we're so grateful for you to be joining us and being a part of the service today. I also want to welcome uh, Madison McBain. Is Maddie here? Oh, there it's Maddie. Uh, Ma uh, Madison, as some of you have already met her, uh, is serving this summer with Atlantic Baptist Women, and she's going to be hosting and being a part of the leadership of Vacation Bible Schools throughout the land of Canada. I think she's involved in maybe seven or more uh, Vacation Bible Schools, including the one that's happening here at Bridgewater Baptist on the first week of August. And if you got a bulletin today, you'd probably find a, a brochure about that. Uh, anyone in the community is welcome to come and be a part of those uh, mornings from August 1st to 5th. 
and uh, kids can uh, come and register. It is a fun time of getting to know uh, the Bible, getting to encounter Jesus, and the fun of being a part of the community as we go back in time to be a part of a Jerusalem market. Uh, Maddie has been volunteering this month with Pastor Erica, and uh, she's actually going to be with us until the 20th, and then she's heading off to begin the rest of her work across Canada, and will be back with us in August, and she'll be a part of our service today as well. Um, the elephant in the room, for those who are in the room, would probably notice that I'm doing something I never do. I'm, I'm wearing a tie, and it wasn't because Brian and Ross Ann are here. And someone said that, like, did you want to get a tie because you saw Brian? Okay, that is the reason why, but no. Um, this is a gift that I got last weekend, and I just wanted to wear it in memory of uh, Reverend Dr. Roger Prentice. I know some of you know uh, Roger Prentice. He was the chaplain at Acadia University for 22 years, a part of our uh, Canadian Baptist family. He was ordained uh, in our Baptist churches and has served um, just his whole life, really, uh, lifting up God's people in our Baptist uh, fellowship, but far beyond. Uh, Roger, throughout the decades, uh, was very involved in youth ministry and camping ministry, church hockey teams. He started the infamous Fezziwig celebration throughout Christmas in Wolfville, and he was a member of the Wolfville Baptist Church. Roger um, often was, was almost always seen either wearing a tie, which he had a thousand of them, or a clergy collar. And I was given, this is Roger's tie, and that's why I'm wearing it today. Well, let's open our, our time of worship today, this Trinity Sunday, in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks on this Sunday morning as we join with your people, the church in Christ around the world, on this Trinity Sunday. For uh, over a thousand years now, this Sunday after Pentecost, Christians in the Western world have remembered the mystery of the Trinity that came to us, revealed to us through the work of your Holy Spirit. And today, God, as we worship you and as we give you honor and praise, we do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For it is Jesus who revealed to us this truth of who you are, one God in three persons. Lord, we pray that you would be honored and glorified through this service and in our lives. For we pray this together in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen.
I will be reading Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us has been given as but to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. we come to this time of prayer this morning, uh, we're going to be having a musical interlude in just a moment so that you can continue just in quietness uh, in your seats as we share together in prayer. This, the, the realities that we know about our faith, the, the mysteries of our faith, have been revealed to us through the work of God's Spirit and in God's Word. And as Maddie read today, it is the desire of the Father that we would grow and that we would grow in maturity and grow into the full body that God has intended us to be with Christ at our head. When the disciples were following Jesus, they were often confused. And it's interesting that it is in time, as we heard even in this passage, that God would work in their lives so they would come to understand the fullness of what it is that Jesus was doing, the fullness and the depth of the gospel. And today we're going to be reflecting on one of those truths that they discovered that we as the church have reflected on in the teaching of the Trinity. But first, as we come to this time of prayer, there's a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, a prayer that we will share together. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you have called us to be your people. You have called us through the work of your Holy Spirit to become a part of your body, your living presence within the world. And that that body, the body of Christ, is made up of many parts, many members, of which each of us are called into one faith, one baptism, we're following one Lord, unified in one spirit, a part of the one church. And so now we pray together as your followers in the words that Jesus taught his disciples praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue in a spirit of prayer as Matthias comes and leads us.
Thank you so much. As the worship team comes to lead us in our uh, next song of worship, I wanted just to make a short announcement. So the worship team is welcome to come up and get ready for the next song. Um, there was a, a little, um, I don't know, Kleenex box, shoe box. There was a tattered little box that used to be in the foyer of our church. And it was called the suggestion box, or the, uh, you know, if you got a question. And many of you know that we've been having this series on, uh, you know, so glad you asked questions and responses to aspects of our faith. It's also an opportunity for people to, to raise questions or, or make suggestions or, or to let, reach out to the deacons or pastors. And uh, this week, uh, it had a transformation, a makeover. And I'm, I want to show it to you. Special thanks to Morris Casibo, who has made us our new box. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, well, well done. And so this is going to be placed in the foyer again. If you have questions about your faith, about life, or about the Bible, this is a great place to drop off those questions or come and speak to one of the pastors or deacons directly. In the same way, you might have suggestions or questions about the church. This is a great, if, you, if you don't know who to speak to, drop it in the box. Make sure you put your name in contact, or we can't really do anything much with your, with your comment, but put it in the box and we'll make sure we reach out to you. Anyway, thank you so much, Morris, for your work and the beautiful addition to our foyer. Thanks.
Amen. Thank you, worship team. So glad you asked. For those who are visiting today, this is a series that we've been sharing together as a church uh, over these last few months since uh, towards the end of May, and we'll continue until the first Sunday of July. And we're just receiving questions from members of our community who listen in on the radio, who are part of our service online, and as well as members uh, here who are in the congregation. And so I want to thank you for the great questions we continue to get week after week, and some of them have going back actually several months. So I'm just going to jump right into it because we have three questions that we want to look at briefly today. So glad you asked about the Trinity. And so these questions do kind of come at uh, the question of the Trinity from different perspectives. Question number one. And uh, this question was raised uh, uh, probably a, uh, a couple of months ago. So if you've been waiting for an answer, I apologize for the wait. The person wrote, was God always three persons or did this happen when Jesus was born? Was God always three persons or was is this something that changed in history? That's a great question. And as Christians, uh, I think we often take for granted the story of, of, of Christmas how important that is in all of human history. The, the miracle, the, uh, the amazing mystery of the incarnation, that God would become flesh and dwell among us. I want to read to you just uh, one of the many passages that uh, we find in the New Testament about the coming of Jesus and the incarnation. And I want you, just as I read it, notice how God is talked about. Maybe you've heard these passages many times before, but maybe this is something I'll just draw to your attention today. How is God described in these passages? So this is uh, beginning from uh, uh, Luke's gospel, I believe. Yeah, Luke. And the angel said to her, that's Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. Right at the very beginning of the story of the Gospels, we already start seeing God appearing in three persons. God the Most High, or as Jesus refers to him as Father, Abba, God the Father. The coming of God's Spirit upon Mary, the Holy Spirit that descends upon Jesus like a dove. That Spirit that Jesus breathes and his Spirit goes upon his disciples after the resurrection. The Holy Spirit. And then Jesus himself, the Son of God, the Christ, the the Messiah that was long anticipated, the Son of David, who would come into the world to seek and save the lost, the Lamb and the Lion, as we sang about this morning. Or as John shares in his gospel, the Word of God became flesh. Now, what happens in the church is they have to try to read passages like this, reflect on this mystery that they encountered in Jesus and in his life and death and resurrection, and try to make sense of that. And a word that we often use to try to to talk about that process of making sense, of thinking about God, is theology or theological reflection. And that's something that the church has to do is they try to make sense of what just happened? (laughs) Who is this Jesus? And now, how do we understand the God that God's people have worshipped since the beginning of the story. Theological reflection is something that we as the church continually do, as we wrestle with what we find in Scripture and our experience and what it means to live as a part of God's people, a part of the body of Christ. And so the question, was God always three persons? Well, that's, that's a challenging one for people who have been there amongst the first church in the early church, in the book of Acts, because they grew up, most of them as Jews, reciting the Shema, which is, as you see here in Deuteronomy 6.4, begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's this firm, clear understanding that there is one God, the God most high. In Hebrew, the words here are Shema, which is, uh, Shema, which is hear, or pay attention, Israel. 
Yahweh, which is the name that God gives to Moses, at least the, the version of it, are often your Bibles will have the capital letters for Lord to represent that, is our Elohim. The, the word is here is inserted in English to help us make sense of this in our, the way we speak. But the actual Hebrew is Yahweh is Elohim. Elohim is a Hebrew word for God. But it's interesting that Elohim is a very particular word for God, and we'll look at that in a second. Yahweh, again, his name, is one, is one. The word Elohim that's used here, this Hebrew word, appears over 2,500 times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And it is a plural name for God. It'd be like saying, the Lord our God is God's. <laughs> It's plural. It's a plural form of the word God for the, for the Hebrew people. Now, the, the, the Hebrew, the Jewish people, the G, Jesus was a Jew. He grew up in the first century Judea. They did not believe in a pantheon of gods. They weren't polytheistic. They, were, they believed there was one God. But to say he was God wasn't big enough. And so you get throughout the Hebrew Bible references to God which are plural, which is fascinating because they, they didn't believe in many gods. They believed that there was one God. But when they describe him, like take a look at just at the very beginning of your Bible in Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man. And the word for man there is actually, you could better translate it as humanity because it's, it's, it's a large word. It, it's like a category. Let us create humanity in our image. Even in the very beginning, in those those first chapter of the Bible, God is referred to in the plural, in our image. In our likeness, let them rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and all the earth, over all creatures that move along the ground. And as you continue reading through Genesis, like in Genesis chapter 3, we see again, and the Lord, that's the Lord, again, that's the word Yahweh, God said, the man has now become like us. So God is one, but there's this mystery because God, God is too mysterious. He's too great for our minds to even understand. And so the references to God include, the, include these plural pronouns. Again, we find in Isaiah, this is a good example, Isaiah 45, three times, three times <laughs> in Isaiah 45, we read, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. So again, the Hebrew scriptures hold together this mystery of who God is and this clear boundary, there is only one God. There is one God most high. I am Yahweh, again, this is God's, the name that was given to Moses, and there is no other, no Elohim besides me. There is no other gods besides me. I am God's. I am God. Philip says to Jesus, Lord, Show us the Father, for that's enough for us. The disciples desperately want to meet this God, this Yahweh, the one who appeared in the burning bush to Moses. They want to know the God that Jesus prays to, his Father. And do you ever notice Jesus' response to those disciples? He says to them, Am I with you all for so long a time, and you have not known me, Philip? The one having seen me has seen the Father. How is it to say, show us the Father? How do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? I'm not speaking the words which I am saying to you from myself, but from the Father abiding in me and doing his works. And Jesus goes on and he describes to them in his own life and ministry that if they have seen the Father, they have seen him. He is doing the will of his Father. He is, as Hebrews tell, tells us, the, invis the visible representation of the invisible God. Again, we also see this in Colossians. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. And so as the early church wrestles with what does it mean? How do we understand all these things? The idea or the concept of the Trinity really begins with Jesus. For encountering Jesus Christ as the Son of God and experiencing the power of God's Spirit in our lives as his followers, the disciples and the early church realized that our understanding of God 
it's far more mysterious and far more better and more beautiful than what we could ever have imagined. And as you look at the different threads of references to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Scripture, the early church started pulling these threads together and started to, to, to form our understanding of what we now call the Trinity. For there was never a time when the Son did not exist, as we read in John. He was there from the beginning of all creation. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are fully God. Now, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit's not the Son, and the Son's not the Father, and the Father's not the Spirit. You've seen the whole diagram before. But God has always been three persons. We just didn't understand it. We see through a glass dimly, but one day we will see face to face. Second question. Did that clear it all up yet? <laughs> no, probably not. We, we come to this date, by the way, the, the uh, celebration of Trinity Sunday. This has been celebrated and observed in the church since the 9th century. In the 14th century, it became a, an official uh, day of observation in the Christian calendar. And it comes on the day after Pentecost. Every year after Pentecost Sunday, Christians around the world reflect on the mystery of the Trinity. That's what we're doing today. Because it is so central to how we understand who God is and a recognition that the only reason we're able to even talk about God as Father, Son, and Spirit is because God sent his Spirit into the church and is his Spirit that is leading us into all truth. So you're probably all involved in some way in doing some theological reflection, and these next two questions are good examples of that. So a person wrote to me, this is earlier in the, in the spring, and said, I have a theory about the Trinity. You gotta love that. And like anytime someone says to you, I've got a theory about something, like I wanna lean in, like, okay, tell me, what are you thinking? I've got a theory about the Trinity. And if you've ever had that conversation, maybe with your kids or your grandkids or a friend or at a Bible study, I've been thinking about something, that's good. I mean, it doesn't mean we're gonna get it right. It doesn't mean we're gonna hit the, the target right in the center. But wrestling and having conversation and wrestling with what the scriptures are telling us and how we understand it, you know, how do we apply that to our lives, those are conversations that the church is constantly called to be a part of. So I have a theory about the Trinity. Okay, let's hear it. God the Father lives and works through our mind. God the Son of emotion operates through the heart. And then he writes, God the Holy Spirit is the keeper for us for eternity and longs to start awareness of all of God's greatness, nurture this and reunite us in heaven when we exi exit our earthly bodies. But the theory goes on. The last one means the Spirit brings, gives us life for a purpose. And we're here to discover and live out that purpose. A verse that comes to mind when I received adult baptism is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And so you can kind of see as he's been thinking and reflecting, this person's taken those three ideas of the heart, the soul, and the mind and tried to connect them to what is the Trinity and how does the Trinity impact our lives. So the question, this is where the question comes in, is there references to this idea above found in song and the Bible? So is this just coming out of the blue or is this some way connected to what I'm reading in scripture is this question. So thank you so much for the person who wrote this question. Uh, this is a great example of someone who's doing theological reflection, who's wrestling with what, I, what do I believe and how do I make sense of what I'm reading in the Bible? And this is something that we have been doing as the church since the very beginning. And we shouldn't stop because it's our calling to interpret and to, to wrestle with and understand what does it mean to be a part of God's people, to be a part of the body of Christ. Now, um, when I talked about the relationship within God that we see in Scripture, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, theologians often refer to that as the imminent trin trinity. That's the, the relationship between the three persons. God is one, and God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what uh, our friend here is reflecting on isn't so much about the composition of how the trinity is all fitted together, this, this communion of mutual love and self-giving, this conversation, this experience between the Father, Son, and Spirit that people often in the church have reflected and sung and written about. Now he's talking about a different, it's almost like you take that understanding of the Trinity and you flip it backwards and look on the other side of the Trinity. And the question is, if this is who God is, then how do we interact with that God? How does that God touch our lives? 
How does that God interact with history and salvation and the church? And that is a question that Christians have been wrestling with also for about 2,000 years. It's often referred to as the economic trinity. How, what, economic being not about money, but about what work God is doing. What is the work of God the Father? What is the work of the Holy Spirit? What is the work of the Son? Maybe you've reflected about the Trinity in that way, and that is a very legitimate and important way to think about who God is. Another way of thinking about this is you can talk about the Trinity or think about the Trinity and talk about who God is or about what God does. So who God is, the intimate, intimate Trinity, what God does, that's the economic Trinity. And you don't need to remember those terms at all. <laughs> Who is God and what does God do? Those are good questions for us to be reflecting on, and Scripture bears witness to that. The experience of the disciples, the apostles, those early pastors and evangelists refer to what God was doing in history through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit in their lives. So you could spend years trying to map out Scripture. In fact, I encourage you, maybe over the summer, if you wanted to start reading one of the Gospels, and as you read through the Gospels, you know, today we looked at a, an example from Luke's Gospel, and just start noticing every time there's a reference to the Father, every time there's a reference to the Son, every time there's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And you can take a little notebook and start writing, what do I learn about God the Father here? What does this say about the Spirit? What does this say about the Son? That is, that's a wonderful way to engage your Bible and say, okay, what is the Holy Spirit teaching us about who God is and what God does? Because there is an interrelationship within God. Because God is one. God isn't, we don't worship three separate gods. We worship one God who is revealed to us in three persons. And those two things, like th that it sounds like a paradox or a contradiction, welcome to theology. <laughs> I mean, these two things, we co they come together, and how they stick together is a mystery. It's like two magnets that you try to push together, and God is one, and God is three, and there's energy there because they don't naturally fit logically. But the church, the Council of Chalcedon in 381, came to the understanding that this is the God that's revealed in Jesus and in the Bible. In fact, the Bible wasn't fi finished yet. It, you know, it would be a few more years, but even before the Bible is finalized, the church realized in the writing of the scriptures and in the witness of the Holy Spirit amongst the church that this is the God that Jesus spoke of. This God who is one and three persons. This God that within him is unity and love and this mutual giving, this respect and this sending that happens between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So while there are members of the Trinity, while the members of the Trinity are considered co-equal and co-eternal, they've always existed, and it isn't that the Father is more God than the Son, or that the Son is any more God than the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit are all equally God, according to the Christian orthodoxy. And that was revealed from the scriptures to the church. And they perform roles in cooperation with one another. It's not that like the son sneaks off and does something and surprises the father and the spirit. No, the, the, the understanding through scripture, well, there's a lot of ways to map it out. Let me give you a few examples. Some people have looked at the scriptures and say, well, it seems that everything starts with God the father and then he sends out the son and then the son sends the spirit. There was a great debate about this in the church around the year 1051. Is it that the father sends the son and the spirit or is it that the Father send, and the Son send the Holy Spirit? I mean, you can really start getting kind of turned up, trying to figure out and draw those maps and diagrams. And so some people are like, oh, no, no, this isn't a good picture of God. Let's go with this picture of God. That was God the Father, and then the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. And others were like, no, 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 that, that it isn't a hierarchy like that. It's, it's relational. So maybe it's better to, to think them of this way that there is the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And then some people said, no, 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 that, that, that's too confusing. It actually, it, it's the Son, it's through Jesus that we start to understand who the Father and the Spirit is. So maybe we should draw it this way. And in the end, the church said, this is a mystery. <laughs> if you, the more we tried to map it out, the more we tried to make everything black and white, it's pretty quick that we slip into heresy. We start to, to make a, a version of God that doesn't live up to all that scripture bears witness to. And so I, I like the Trinitarian, the Trillium symbol from our Celtic brothers and sisters. 
There's, there, there's the image of the Trinity. <laughs> At least it's the one that I like. It's not a math question. We talked about this over the last few years. In fact, you're not going to get all your answers probably about the Trinity after this Sunday because we will spend our lives in this mystery of understanding God is one and three. But I do encourage you to go back in our archives at the church here at Bridgewater Baptist. You can look at last May or the year before or probably the year before that. There's always sermons and teaching on the Trinity. In fact, last year we did a three-part series, which is kind of, you know, fitting. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the laugh. <laughs> this is a great statement. This is Michael Horton who wrote, in treating the doctrine of the Trinity, I observe the danger of trying to separate the work of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in terms of creation, redemption, the application, salvation. In every act of the Godhead, each person is engaged. Each has a distinct work to perform in the economy, what God does, but every work is done through the Father, in the Son, and through the Holy Spirit. I misspoke there. Everything is done from the Father, in the Son, and through the Holy Spirit. And so those, those three words, from, in, and through, are a pretty good way to think about the, how the Holy Trinity works in our lives. From the Father, in the Son, through the Spirit. And last year we actually looked at this and said, okay, how do we look at creation as Trinitarians, as people who understand God as Holy Trinity? And again, we, we saw that that creation from the Father, in the Son, through the Holy Spirit. That all three are involved. In fact, every aspect of our faith, from what happens on the cross, to what, what happens in our lives as believers, to what will happen on the other side of, of glory, God is involved, Father, Son, and Spirit. Loving and experiencing God, as our friend points out, involves the mind and the heart and the soul. But I, I think we have to be careful. It's not like that only God the Father is interested in the mind, only God the Son is interested in your heart, and only the Holy Spirit's interested in your soul. Certainly it is true that God is concerned about your mind. Jesus is concerned about your heart, your emotions. The Holy Spirit is concerned about your soul. But just for an example, if you think about our minds, it, yes, God has thoughts and truth that he wants to enter our minds, but scripture also tells us not just to be filled with the mind of God, but to have the mind of Christ. That truth is Christ. Jesus is the truth. And that the Holy Spirit is renewing our mind and leading us into all truth. In other words, it's, it's easy to try to oversimplify the Trinity and to kind of draw our own little chart. And we start to realize in scripture, no, God is involved in all three persons in every aspect of our lives. So, did I answer that question? Kind of. <laughs> you know, this, we've called this So Glad You Asked because we're not giving questions and answers. We're often giving, hearing questions and giving responses because some of these questions are too profound. They can't be boiled down to one answer that we can respond and we can lean into and continue to grow in our understanding and our maturity. Last question. I know some of you are ready for lunch. <laughs> okay, last question. Here we go. Thinking about the personalities and roles of the three persons of God. This came actually from one of the Bible studies in the church. A group of people were together having a conversation about the Trinity, and a reporter from the group sent this question in. God the Father can be seen as the mysterious, more distant part. God the Son, in the person of Jesus, as being fully God, but fully man, makes him more relatable for us. But God the Holy Spirit, as we are to understand, draws us, reproaches, leads us, and guides us to repentance and a right relationship with him, which is understandable in the here and now. But what will the Holy Spirit do in heaven? If it seems that, as they're saying, the Holy Spirit does all these things in our lives now, seals us, prepares us, calls us to repentance, gives us faith, what's the Holy Spirit to do when we get to heaven? Is he out of a job? We go on, would perhaps the three persons of God blend into one? Would the Holy Spirit's role change? Maybe we cannot know this, but the question is perplexing. So thank you so much. Another great example of people doing theological reflection, of reflecting on what do we know from the scriptures? How does this apply to our lives? How do we understand these things? And so this is a thank you. Thank you so much for this great example. Um, 
there's lots of things that we know about the Holy Spirit. And as I said earlier, it is Jesus who tells the disciples and his followers that he's sending his Holy Spirit upon them, this helper who is to come. And we celebrated last Sunday in Pentecost the coming of the Holy Spirit upon all believers there at beginning at the day of Pentecost. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. It's interesting in this statement, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to be with you until when? Forever. Thank you. <laughs> you can read. <laughs> forever. The Holy Spirit will be with you forever. He will never leave you. And of course, Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Exactly. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So when we, if you were to think about what's the Holy Spirit going to be doing in the next, in the next life, well, he's going to be with you. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you, as Jesus says about himself. You will be with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance of all that I said to you. And so the Holy Spirit, as we were talking about the mind earlier, is involved in helping us to live into and to lean into and to be a part of the truth that God has for us. And that is now and forever. The kingdom of God is now and not yet. There's more to come. And even after we die, when we are with God in the new creation, God, it doesn't mean that everything stops. Sometimes I think we think of, of life after death as something static, like a painting. Mark Twain, I imagine many of you know, said, I don't, the way that a lot of Christians talk about heaven, it's but the last place I want to be, sitting on a cloud, playing a harp. Maybe if Matthias was playing the, the, the guitar, that wouldn't be so bad. No, God is doing something. God is doing a work. In fact, the images that we get in the book of Revelation of what is to come is, is not something static on a cloud. It's a new heaven and a new earth, and God is doing things, and there is jobs and tasks and things waiting for us on the other side of this life. And we are, we're, we're going to continue to need the help of the Holy Spirit. When the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who perceives from the Father, he will testify about me. The Holy Spirit now in our lives is leading us closer and closer into who Jesus is and the life that he has created us to have in him. But that life does not end at the end of this life. Our faith is a resurrection faith and that what God started in our lives, he will see to completion. It's interesting in the, in the story of creation, if we were to look back in those passages in Genesis, it speaks about, well, John tells us that the word is Jesus. It is the, the logos, the, the Christ was there in the beginning. The Father was there. But the Holy Spirit is also described in Genesis, the Spirit of God brooding over the waters like a bird. That the Holy Spirit is there, and it is through the Spirit that life and creation comes into being. And if that is true in creation in the beginning of the story, it's also true in new creation as we move to what God has in store. That the Holy Spirit's work of creation and recreation and new creation is yet to come. And it will be God's Spirit at work in us and beyond us in what God has in store for this great, massive universe that from our own perspective here on this planet is without end. So God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are at work. And Someone might say, do I have to understand the Trinity in order to be a Christian? The answer, I hope not. <laughs> because none of us are going to understand the Trinity this side of eternity. No, we don't need to understand the Trinity. But we, as we bear witness to what the Holy Spirit is drawing us into, even through Scripture, we understand that God isn't just static and small and little. He's not the, the God of the theist who created the world and, and left and is now somewhere off and with his feet up, waiting for this all to unwind. No, God is intimately involved in his creation, intimately involved in our lives. And that God is a person. And he designed, created us so that we would be in relationship with him. And that we could be a part of his story forever. That is the good news of Trinity Sunday. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today that we can come and worship you. We can't always understand it all, and though we would want to understand. Lord, we know that it is your spirit who is leading us into all truth. God, we thank you that you did not remain distant, but Lord, you've always come and drawn near your people, from walking in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, to speaking to Moses through the burning bush. Again and again throughout history, you've come and you've drawn near to us, even when we were broken. For Jesus came, a friend of sinners, to call us into new life and transformation through the work of his spirit. God, we thank you on this Trinity Sunday that we can worship you and that we can know you and that we can trust you in all things. For in Jesus' name we pray, everyone said, amen. Let's stand together as we join the worship team in singing, Holy, Holy, Holy.
May we go forth from this service into this new day and the week that lies ahead in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. God bless.